Dr. Sage here, back with the second of three lectures discussing phylogenies and the history of life. In this video, we're going to discuss determining evolutionary relationships. By the end of this video, you should be able to compare homologous and analogous traits, discuss the purpose of cladistics, and describe the principle of maximum parsimony. So in order to determine evolutionary relationships, we use diversity of evidence to determine relationships among organisms and higher taxa. We use many different sources of information, so morphologic, form and function, physiologic, behavioral, and genetics. Now, if two different species have some similar characteristics, there are a couple of reasons they could have those similar characteristics. One of them is homologous characteristics. This is similarity due to evolutionary origin. So they have a common ancestor that had that similar trait that both of the descendant species has. We can determine this based upon genetics and developmental origin. The more complex the character, the more likely it's of the same origin, the same ancestral species. They often look similar, but not always. Okay, so for example, if we look at the bones in appendages, so whether it be an arm from a human, a leg from a dog, a wing from a bird, or a flipper from a whale, they all have the same basic bone structure. Okay, there's one bone here, two bones here, a set of wrist bones, and a set of hand bones. And it's the same bone structure in all those different appendages, even though they're used for very different purposes. The bones have just become adapted over time to serve their different purposes. Why is this? Because these species all derive from a common ancestor that had that similar bone structure. Okay, so these are homologous structures, similarity that is due to a common ancestor. The other would be analogous structures. This is similarity due to functional or ecological constraints or pressures. In other words, they have similar selective pressures, not necessarily a recent common ancestor. Characters can be very similar pairs due to evolutionary convergence. Convergence occurs in unrelated or distant related taxa when characters are shaped by similar ecological or evolutionary constraints. So similar selective pressures, natural selection. These result in homoplasies, which are analogous traits due to convergent evolution. So for example, the wing of a bird and the wing of an insect, they serve similar purposes. They arose through similar selective pressures, having the ability to fly, but those two different structures are not there in those two different organisms because a recent common ancestor had that structure. So this is convergent evolution. Structures evolving from the same evolutionary pressures, but not from a common ancestor having that trait. Examples are the wings in birds versus the wings in insects, or worms being legless and snakes being legless. Okay, or another example, these two organisms, a sugar glider and a flying squirrel, they look very similar to each other, okay? But the reason they look similar to each other is not because they have a recent common ancestor. Instead, it's because they have similar selective pressures that cause them to have those physical characteristics. So these two organisms, those characteristics they have are analogous traits, not homologous traits. How do we know it's not because of recent common ancestor? Well, these two species are actually very different from each other. The sugar glider is a marsupial, okay? Those are the organisms that have the pouch where the development completes outside in that pouch. Things you're more familiar with that have that is like kangaroos or koala bears or possums. Whereas a flying squirrel is a placental mammal. Okay, things like us, humans, or dogs or cats, where it finishes development inside the placenta. Okay, so they are not closely related to each other. They just both happened to gain that ability separately due to similar selective pressures. So that's an analogous trait, not a homologous trait. Something else can occur is called an evolutionary reversal. This is where ancestral traits are sometimes lost in descendants in one groups. For example, the loss of limbs in snakes, whereas all other reptiles have limbs, but snakes don't have limbs. Or the hind limbs or legs of cetaceans. Cetaceans are things like whales and dolphins. So for example, if you look at these organisms, by looking at these organisms, these two seem to have similar analogous characteristics. Okay? They have similar body plans, body shapes, they 
live in a similar environment. But that is not because of a recent common ancestor. Okay, this dolphin is a mammal. Okay, whereas this shark is not a mammal, it's a fish. Okay, the dolphin is actually more closely related to this cat here than it is to this shark here. Okay, so this similarity is due to analogous characters, not homologous characters. This is also an example of that evolutionary reversal. Why? Because the dolphin evolved from an organism that used to walk on the land, like this land mammal over here. Okay, one way we can determine how closely related organisms are to each other is by doing molecular comparisons. So using nucleotide sequences, DNA and RNA as characters, we can use this to provide insights into evolutionary relationships and new phylogenies. Okay, so for example, let's say we take a gene, one of my favorite genes, the FOXO gene, and we look at the sequence of that gene in different species and we compare it to humans. Well, if you compare the sequence in a salmon to a human for this particular gene, okay, we do have a common ancestor with the salmon, but it's not a recent common ancestor. In that gene, only about 50% of its DNA is identical to the DNA that we have for that gene. Okay, in this diagram, you can see that represented by wherever there's uh, identical sequences. They highlight with these little asterisks here where the sequences are not identical, you don't have the asterisks. So you can easily just see this in this depiction. We're not that similar to the salmon in this gene. Now, let's say we move to something else that's more similar to us, a mammal, a mouse, okay? And 88% of the, this particular gene is identical to what we have. Compared to something that's even more similar to us, a primate, okay, 92% of it is identical to the gene that we have. Something even more similar to us, a chimpanzee, and 99% of this gene is identical between the chimpanzee and the human. We can use the DNA sequence to determine how closely related organisms are to each other. Okay, why do phylogenies matter? Okay, well, understanding true evolution relationships is important. It helps us understand the evolutionary process. If research on related species may help to better understand human health and medical issues, oftentimes we study other species to understand human health. Those are called model organisms. We track, can use this to track evolution of parasites and viruses. We use biotechnology to produce more productive crops and domesticated animals. We produce more effective drugs like human in insulin, for example and improve conservation efforts for threatened and endangered species. So how do you build a phylogenetic tree or an evolutionary tree? Okay. Well, this uses cladistics, which is a process to arrange taxa by homologous characters into clades or branches on a cladogram. The goal is to produce cladograms where all clades are monophyletic. So what does monophyletic mean? A monophyletic group includes all descendants of a given ancestor. It includes the most recent common ancestor and all of its descendants. Okay, so what does that mean? So in this example, if we were to include this common ancestor here and all of its descendants, that would be a monophyletic group, also called a clade. Or if we were to include this common ancestor here and all of its descendants, that would also be a monophyletic group or a clade. Okay, now there are some things that are also not monophyletic groups. For example, we could have a paraphyletic group. That's where you do have the common ancestor and it includes some, but not all of its descendants. So that's not monophyletic, it's paraphyletic. Or you can have polyphyletic. That's where you have organisms, but their common ancestor is not included in the group. And then you have monophyletic, a true clade. That's where you have a common ancestor and all of its descendants. Monophyletic groups depict evolutionary relationships. All organisms within a clade or monophyletic group stem from a single point node on the tree. A clade may contain multiple groups, as in the case of animals, fungi, and plants, or a single group, as in the case of flagellates. So for example, shown in green here, we have a clade that has its common ancestor and all of its descendants, and it includes multiple groups, animals, fungi, and plants. Over here, we have another clade, it includes the common ancestor and its descendants, those are the flagellates. Groups that diverge at a different branch point, or they do not include all groups in a single branch point, are not considered true clades. For example, this here, 
where we have the animals and plants and the common ancestor, but we don't have the fungi, that's not a true clade, that's not a monophyletic group. Or if we have the ciliates and the flagellates, okay, but we don't have their common ancestor or all of the descendants from what would be their common ancestor, so that would be this point here. So that would not be a monophyletic group. So organisms, taxa, evolve from common ancestors, then diversify, and we repeat this many times. So essentially what happens is there's a change in genetic makeup of an organism, which leads to a new trait, which may become prevalent in the group. Many organisms descend from this point and have this new trait. New variations continue to arise. Some are adaptive and persist, leading to new traits. With new traits, a clade is determined. And then you go back to step one and you repeat this over and over. And that's so you can get all the different organisms living on this planet. Now something to note about evolution is evolution does not lead to perfection. Mutations are random. They arise by random chance. And it takes many mutations to lead to a new trait. The traits may be beneficial, or it may be harmful, or it might be neutral, it might make no difference. It depends on the particular environmental pressures at that moment. Evolution is change in organisms over time. Note that individuals do not evolve, populations evolve. And like I said, evolution does not lead to perfect organisms. For example, our eyes are not perfect. Our eyes, we have a blind spot in our eyes due to the organization of our eyes. Whereas an octopus doesn't have this blind spot. So hypothetically, the eye of the octopus is more perfect than our eye is. So what that means is evolution does not lead to perfection. There's not gonna be any X-Men anytime soon. All right, so when you're constructing a cladogram, you want to determine the relatedness of organisms. One way of determining that is using shared ancestral characters. These are found in the common ancestor of a taxa and all members of the clade have it although some may have lost it after that. It's used to identify membership to the larger group, all descended from the same common ancestor. For example, all of these organisms have a shared ancestral character. They all have vertebrae. They all have a spinal column. So that would be an ancestral character for these organisms. Now, if you compare these organisms they all have another shared ancestral character. They have legs, whereas these organisms do not have legs. Okay, so legs would be a shared ancestral character for these organisms, but not for these ones. So a shared ancestral character is something that the ancestor had and all of its descendants have, unless they've lost it secondarily. You can also have shared derived characters. They arose or derived within the larger clade distinguishes those that share it from those that do not, provides information about relatedness within the larger group. It is used to identify branch points or nodes within the larger clay. So for example, like I just mentioned, if you're comparing all of these organisms, okay, legs is not a shared ancestral character for all of them, but legs is a derived character for this subgroup within that group. Now, when you're forming these phylogenetic trees, you also have to form them based upon the rule of maximum parsimony. So the rule of parsimony says that you choose the simplest cladogram with the fewest steps or events needed to make that cladogram. Maximum parsimony assumes that the tree that requires the fewest evolutionary events, so appearance of shared derived characters, is the most likely. You might have heard of this in your other classes, like a philosophy class, for example, in the terms Occam's razor. Occam's razor basically says that the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. For example, let's say I was teaching on campus today. Well, most likely what happened is I went from my home to campus to teach. That's the simplest explanation for how I got there. It's much less likely that I went from my home in Florida up to Rhode Island and then drove back to campus in Florida. Okay, in order to teach today on campus. Okay, that's very much less likely. Okay, why? It has a lot more events, driving all the way up north and then back south, than just going straight to work. Okay, the same applies for forming these phylogenetic trees. So, for example, let's say you have these different species. Species one has trait A, species two has trait A, B, and C, species three has trait A, B, and D. 
that since all species have trait A, then A would have evolved in the common ancestor of all of them. Now, since this one, only two has C, C evolved for species two. Since only species three has D, D evolved for species three. Now, B could have evolved twice for species two and for species three, since species A doesn't have it. It wouldn't be in the common ancestor. But that's less likely. What's more likely to have happened is A was a ancestral characteristic for all of these species. B is a drive characteristic for species two and species three. And then two evolved C and three evolved D. Okay, by this, there's four evolutionary events, A, B, C, D. By this method, there's one A, two B, three C, four B, five D, five different events. Four events is more likely to have occurred than five events. It's more likely I went straight to work than I drove out of state to, drove to drive back to campus. Okay, that's the rule of maximum parsimony. Okay, and that's the end of the video. We're going to talk about homologous and analogous traits, maximum parsimony, and forming those phylogenetic trees. In the next video, we're going to continue talking about phylogenetic trees. Until then, this has been Dr. Sage.